I'm always amazed when I go in with teams, like, um, how many coaches don't even know what they have in front of them. Like, they can't even describe their population. Even the team coaches, not just the strength coaches, but they don't know, like, how many minutes does this guy play? What, what kind of, what is his typical, like, physiological makeup? What is his movement profile? What is his fitness profile? What is his performance profile? Um, you know, what are the typical, what are the typical descriptive factors of the game? What are the typical descriptive factors of the game in relationship to how that team plays? It's going to be different if you're looking at NFL or NBA, how they utilize players. They can't, they haven't even done that. And sometimes the answers that you're looking for are right in front of your face. You just have to take some time to look at them. So we execute training, we monitor the result, uh, looking at fitness and fatigue, we manage the process and make changes when necessary, so that's not all the time, and then we execute training again and we can sort of go in that circular pattern until they compete. And when it comes to uh, things that you might evaluate, in the literature there's two different kinds of training loads that are often discussed, external training loads and, and internal training loads. So external training loads uh, might be the things that uh, that we do to the athlete in training. So we can look at you know training outcomes or outputs and volumes and intensities and uh, speeds, etc. We can look at CNS output. We use multiple different jumps tests to do that. Uh, GPS data. Um, you, you can evaluate certainly from like a conditioning or a practice standpoint. Um, uh, ben from Catapult is here. It's got a lot of stuff on that. If, if you're interested in that stuff, then I'll show you some uh, some GPS stuff later on in the presentation. And environmental factors can also play a big result. So uh, not so much in Portland, it's generally a pretty even-tempered um, climate, but if you're in the south and you're running a football team and guys are practicing in pads with 75% humidity, that's definitely going to impact their internal training response. And internal training response is basically how the athlete responds to what we did to them. So we can look at this with things like session heart rate or heart rate recovery. We utilize submax fitness testing for things like that, usually once or twice a week. Subjective profiles and session RPEs, which I'll talk a little bit about and how we standardize those approaches. Autonomic system readiness, omega wave readouts, we use that stuff. And then I, I haven't used blood and saliva collection um, in terms of post-workout. We use it at the, at the front end of training, but uh, never in post-workout. But I know people do it, so I put it up there, um, but I don't have guys like sit there. So if it's important, measure and manage it. When I go in and meet with GMs and presidents of sports teams, coaches, uh, this is the big question that I always ask them. Because I can tell you what's important to me and what I think would be important to them, but I need them to tell me what's important as well. Because they might have other factors that they want to look at. Um, could be like performance factors, like game game factors that they want to add into the mix. And how does, uh, how does performance how is performance influenced by things they do in practice or whatever it may be. So there might be other factors that they think is important, are important. And then some of the low hanging fruit when you're thinking about keeping it simple. I'm amazed at how many people don't have good training journals. Like, uh, so we've got a lot of NFL guys and uh, you know, they tell me like, yeah man, when, when we go back to our team, the coach doesn't, uh, the strength coach doesn't provide us any like weights to lift. Like they just say, so I'm like, so you, you say that you go in and the coach says, squat, three sets of five, bench press, three sets of five, and do uh, chin-ups, three sets of eight, and they're like, yeah, exactly. I was like, so they don't prescribe like for intensities, they don't prescribe RPEs, they don't prescribe anything. So like, no. So I'm like, oh yeah, that's really good for us, because then he doesn't know what the hell you're doing in the weight room, other than you're just going through his workout. So what I do with those guys is I build um, an Excel dashboard for them, and all they do is they wake up every morning, uh, they take their information, they take their data, they type it in, and it's all color-coded. And then I provide them with logic on the back end of that. That basically says, if your, you know, if your colors are this, whatever you would normally do in training for squats, three sets of five, just back off by 20 or 30 percent. So then they can go in and live with a team and do three sets of five, but they still get the, uh, their body gets the recovery that it needs. And when it's a good day, hit the gas pedal. If it says three sets of five, maybe you, uh, you know, go for a PR or something like that. So we give them some sort of. Uh, document or a Excel sheet dashboard that basically modulates with them and they can track it over time. And it's cool because then guys send you texts like, man, I feel really healthy, this is awesome. Like, I haven't felt this good, it's, you know, going through practice and stuff like that. Their section RPE, so how they rated themselves and we multiply it by the duration of training in minutes. This is not counting the cool down period and it's not counting any sort of foam rolling or soft tissue work or stuff like that above, uh, before, uh, that precedes training. This only counts once they start their actual dynamic warm up, going through, you know, stuff that's gonna get their heart rate up and break a sweat, to their last piece of training. 
And then after that, once they start their cool down, the clock starts, and we just run it, and we take them through a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, what you want to do with this information is not just collect it. So sometimes people will collect the stuff, and they'll be like, oh, no, it doesn't show us anything. And I'm just, which is always funny to me, because then I'm like, well, do you think you could send me the data? Because that'd be really cool. I've never seen it not show you anything. And then we get the data, and we're like, hey, check this out. Like, there's all this kind of cool stuff about some of your players that you should probably know about. So a lot of times people don't look at it over time or they don't evaluate it against other things they're collecting. By itself, it's just numbers on a page. You have to put some context around it. We're always looking for negative trends and atypical responses. You know, some coaches will tell me, like, yeah, yeah, I do that stuff. And, and you know, I just look at the average and our team's doing really great. And I'm just like, yeah. And then I look at their data and I'm like, yeah, your team's doing really great, except for these two guys that are getting freaking destroyed. So I'm most interested in the atypical guys, the negative response or the negative trends.